cultural clue, and that's filmmaking, and that's where we're going to start. My name's Rob. Uh, I'm a journalism professor. I live in Berlin. I obviously do not have a German accent. I'm American, um, but I've worked abroad for the last 10 years um, doing this kind of stuff and teaching journalists worldwide how to do this. I teach at two journalism schools, one in Paris, one in Austria. The only two journalism sc schools that I know of right now that require every journalism student to be a mojo. The same way when I went to journalism school, every journalism student had to study com law, ethics, news writing, and editing. Well, guess what? Mojo is now a required skill at that level, at those schools, and probably more before we're done. Um, so just a quick question. Anybody have any trouble getting here? I did. There was a strike. My flight was canceled. It took about half the day yesterday to figure out another way to get to Rome. It felt like this. It wasn't this flight. But it might as well be because we were flying by the seat of our pants to get here. And we're so glad we got here to do a sunrise film walk at 6 this morning and to share with you um, this lecture, which is really designed for those journalism students, for, the, for you. That's who this talk is for. That's the audience I have in mind. If you're a publisher, great. If you're a mid-career uh, journalist, great. If you're a journalism educator, great. But you're not my target audience. You still might get something out of it. Um, but seriously, I was looking at alternate transport. Um, it was al almost going to be that serious um, because we were grounded and we were told by Air Berlin, no flights to Rome until Saturday, which, you know, ain't going to work. I um, wanted to start off with something real quick that I just discovered in my in iPhone, and it's probably just the latest update, and I just hadn't gotten around to it. But did you know you can cut pretty good quality social videos right within the Photos app? I didn't know that either. But all of a sudden, because I had just spent 30 days living in a dusty 4x4 four four in the Atacama Desert in Chile f making films, I... I'd go into my photos app all the time and it would start and it somehow it was like what's this memories thing yeah I was like it's bogus you know I looked at it once or twice I'm like that's not how I would edit it anyways it's kind of cute maybe people consumers will like that what I find out is I dig into it yesterday and I just these are brand new slides no one's seen them you're the first um, is that it's actually a bot that's basically using some metadata from the pictures like maybe location time of day um, faces and it's trying to it's trying to cut a, cut a reel, yeah, from shots in your gallery. And that's cool and enough. You can, um, it does it really quickly, and, um, but you can give it a little help and get a lot better results. It's got, again, some consumer controls. You know, do you want gentle, chill? Do you want it short, medium, long? And it'll kind of algorithmically optimize a suggested reel based on that album that it's detected. Yeah, from the metadata. But if the real power for editors, and, and we're journalists, so that's where we want to go. We want to go to the advanced level. We want to go to that little slider down there and start to get access to the edit, to the shots, the shots that answer story questions. Who, what, when, why, where, how, what happens next? How do we go from here to here? Um, and other things like that, and maybe the length. So, so I'm not in an advanced editing. I'm not in iMovie. I'm not in Luma Fusion. I'm not in anything but my gallery editing and it's just a delight to use you can't do everything you can't do multi-track editing you can't rearrange clips but what you can do can be quite powerful and quick because I'm all about going to the edge of the frontier producing original stories at the highest possible production values in near real time and never ever coming back to a newsroom to file edit or share that's where I live 24-7 so this kind of tool is really great when you're on the fly. See, if you want to get a quick assem first assembly of a scene you just shot, why not just start in a really lightweight app like the Photos app and see what you can make. I, 
I'm referencing Darjeeling Limited for those of you who've ever seen a Wes Anderson movie. Not bad, not bad for this little bot right within there and I could, I could overwrite it, give it just the journalistic and just the filmmaking touches I needed and I instantly I could put that on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, wherever it needed to go. Or to my mom, usually write to my mom's the first social media, you know. So this is revolutionary stuff and that's why I really am addressing this talk to the students because they are the torch bearers. The people who will help us in the new era to find new land. I love that quote. This is from a journalism school in Paris where I teach. It's the new school of journalism. And they take uh, design thinking also as a required skill. So innovation methods combined with mojo. That's the intersection we're exploring today as well. Does anybody know what this is? How, w how would you describe a shot like this? Well, it's, it's the Alps. It's, it's daytime. There's a woman. Um, but it's actually, you know, it's um, anamorphic. It was shot with an anamorphic lens at an aspect ratio of 2.39 to 1. You know, just like Star Wars, Blade Runner, all your favorite movies. But it was shot on my iPhone. That's the difference. Shot at 24 frames per second. Yep. On this little tripod with that iPhone with an anamorphic lens. We now can do things that were way beyond reach, only available to elite Hollywood people or people with expensive rental budgets with our phones. And that is damn exciting because that technology means we can go to the top of the mountain and make a film and it only takes up that much space in the backpack that we're living out of for seven days as we make a hut-to-hut -hut tour around Lesch, Austria. That's the anamorphic lens. That's not cropped to that shape. It's a distortion lens that squeezes optically more information from the sides. And the app you use, Filmic Pro, which is a pro video app, it digitally de-squeezes it. There's the same rig, uh, different mountains. This is the Rocky Mountains. So again, that's where I live. I want to find out where stuff works at the extreme. I don't want to push on the outside of the envelope. By the way, pe most people get that quote wrong. It's push on the outside of the envelope. You've already left the safety zone. The envelope is the safety zone. When t fighter pilots talked about pushing the envelope, they didn't talk about pushing the envelope. You hear a lot of CEOs say that. That's the wrong quote. What the fighter pilots were talking about is like the envelope is the safe place. They're pushing on the outside. They're going already faster than the speed of sound. Okay, they're going into space. That's what I'm, that's my mindset when I'm trying to say where can I make a film? How extreme, what good quality can I get so that I can come back and talk to real journalists and journalism students and, and, and broadcast houses and say this works, that doesn't with authority. Because newsrooms like in Helsinki are now hiring people and their journalists are getting trained and they're being full-time mojos, like Raya. Raya will travel all over Finland, do a lot of Facebook Lives, do a lot of um, photo essays, and she's hugely successful. She's the first mojo in that country, full-time. And she's speaking Finnish. Anybody speak Finnish? Yeah. Okay. What's she saying? It's a little bit stressful, yeah, yeah, because she's the pioneer, but she's leading her team. Now that I went and worked with her and, and 10 other journalists, now there's going to be 10 more. And, you know, so it is early days of a revolution, but it is happening. There is evidence, um, which is why I put a lot of this training into online courses for people like that, for broadcasters, for the schools. So you can get a certificate in it. Um, the same thing with design thinking. Um, sometimes I'm lucky and I get to work with schools like at Stockholm University. It says, we want to do a future of storytelling project. And, and I said, great, that's great. 
how many journalists you got? We got 10 journalists. And so it's like, is there any way we can partner with the technical school? And we're like, well, I don't know, let's ask them. And like one day later, they said yes. They called back and they loved the idea. So I was able to get technologists and journalists together to, uh, to, to explore the future of journalism. And we trained them in mobile journalism and we led them in design thinking workshops um, so that they came up before they did their hackathon. They had a really solid blueprint. They know what their KPIs were, who their user was, what their expectations for iteration might have been um, so that they could explore a technology story, you know, over the course of the semester when I come back in December and judge their projects and they do amazing stuff like this. If you're in journalism school and you're not doing that kind of work, change schools. If you're in a newsroom and you're not doing that kind of work, change jobs. I'm serious. Because I could talk to you all day about the classical things of filmmaking, composition, storytelling, right? But that's not driving it forward. This is what we rely on. This is in the DNA. This is always our center, but it's not the outside of the envelope. It's not the danger zone. And it's great that we could rely on it. No one is going to be reinventing storytelling, by the way. No one is going to come up with some new shot pattern that's going to say, oh, I just figured out how to make uh, video journalism. You use a five-shot method. Guess what? Kodak did it 60, 70 years ago when people were buying Super 8 cameras. A lot of this book was about how to expose the film properly, but there was this beautiful section here about organizing a story, and it's got all the classic elements. What should your shots do? Your shots should answer story questions. Who, what, where, why? Meanwhile, he talks about the content of the shots. Brilliant guy. That is not what we're reinventing. What we're reinventing is ways to reach people's expectations, their customer journey with our content, with our media, with the issues that matter to them. And so the hard work, the frontier right now, is centered around trying to get better answers to these questions because video is now no longer just a little galaxy, it is a universe of galaxies because there are so many ways we can put it together in so many different formats for so many different people. So that is the hard work. I can give you a clue. I've in my research over the last 10 years, I've kind of identified a nice list of 10 so that we can start to have common literacy in our newsrooms and our journalism schools about what we mean when we say we're going to do a video about something. Because it is a galaxy or a universe of galaxies. It's too broad as to be meaningless. So we need to be much more literate, much more specific about what we mean by video. I don't mean just say, oh, we need a Facebook Live that's square. You know, we need 360. Let's talk about 360 as being one category of what you might categorize as uh, immersive video. Phone sim videos like, you know, the Donald Trump presidency or the BBC media action um, refugee crisis. You know, if your phone was like a refugee phone, you know, it puts you into that immersive world. So it's uh, 360 VR, they're all, I put the all, and phone sims, I put them all under the category of immersive. I'll give you a couple quick examples, because guys, I crammed two like keynote speeches into one to give you a lot of value today, right? So I'll give you, um, here's a quick hit. Here's something that was filmed, edited in Twitter app, and uploaded right from within the Twitter app. Build means image or picture in German. It's also Europe's biggest selling newspaper, and they decided to not print any news photos for a special edition this week. They did it ostensibly to protest against reactions from viewers who didn't like seeing a photo of a dead boy washed upon the shore. But do news papers work without news photos? So that's a quick hit. That is recording with your phone while while, you know, talking, 
I'm pointing at something and I've got one thing to say. And that's one clip. And the next clip, and the next clip, the next clip in Twitter. If I didn't like it, I could do take two. But the idea is that's near real time. That went out the second that paper was on the streets. Didn't wait. It was, it was ready to go. Um, kinogram. Anybody know what a kinogram is? Study Latin. Kino is cinema, gram is writing, cinema writing. Kinogram, silent movies. We see them all the time on, s on social media because of auto-playing and auto-muting, which has prompted newsrooms to come up with captioned or subtitled videos that can run without sound. Those are kinograms. They are not new. They are 77 years old. That technology is not new. That story form has been with us since the beginning of cinema because at the beginning of cinema, it, there was no capacity to synchronize sound with pictures. So the music that the audience heard while the newsreels were playing in the movie theater where people went to get their video news could have been anything. Whatever, whatever musicians were there that day. But what they did was they alternated title cards and sequences and gave us kinograms. We can do that with our smartphone. At 16,000 feet. pictures are at the edge, the absolute edge of what's possible with the sensors in the small gear. It is pre-dawn light. Your smartphone does not do well in that light. Some of these shots are a little noisy, but as it gets a little brighter, it becomes even better. So I'm able to cut a reel after freezing my ass off because the only way I can get those shots is to camp out the night before, before the tour buses come. It's um, 14 degrees centigrade. There's an inch of ice on the tent when we wake up. But it gave us 10 minutes at the geysers before all the, the, the nattering yahoos showed up, okay? So that's what it takes to get that kind of footage. And you can get that stabilized, smooth footage by using an Osmo that has a gimbal, tripod, get a time lapse. And there are some apps like Gravi that let you put subtitles and watermarks so you can brand everything you put on social media. Because why let Facebook and Twitter get all the credit for your hard work? Another story form. It's kind of classical. Um, but again, this is an improvised, everything I'm showing you is pretty much an improvised story. This one's completely improvised. I went for a coffee with a colleague and 20 minutes later came out with this. You might imagine you're living in the 19th century when you stroll through the Waqif Souk in Doha. And that is exactly how city planners want you to feel. While there's been a market on this corniche for literally hundreds of years, this throwback version is fairly new. The open air market has cafes, clothing stalls, and incense-laden alleyways. So it may be newly rebuilt, but a few old traditions survive. For example, an Al Mala porter is always nearby with a wheelbarrow to carry your purchases to the car. And there just seems to be a surprise around every corner in this market. It's just a great way to spend a Friday afternoon when the Qatari people are out enjoying the weather and the activities along the Corniche. So went for a coffee, talked with this guy, he's from Poland. Um, he had hired me to do a mojo workshop and he had suggested we meet there. And I said, well, that's great. After the coffee, do you mind if we walk around and I just film a couple shots? And I went back to the hotel room. I looked at my shots. I wrote a script. I wrote eight words for each shot that I was going to use, put it into a new order, wrote a script, put this microphone on my smartphone, put two pillows around on the bed and recorded the voiceover and filed it. Okay. Why? Because I'm insane. 
Um, no, but because I like to explore, can I get broadcast quality? Can I get cinematic quality? Can I do it in near real time from places like that without any of the bureaucracy, without approval from an editor, without a newsroom at all to really listen to? Sometimes it's lonely. But it means you can, so that was like a, a, a walkthrough video. So that was another form of style. So you've seen Quick Hit, you've seen Kinogram, you've seen Walkthrough. I could go on and on. Here's another anamorphic film filmed on the 4th of July in Colorado in the Rocky Mountains. It's more of a music video. It's more of a people, people movie, I guess, when you see scenes. I mean, you have to show that kind of stuff when you are in Europe. I do because it's America. This is the best thing here. These guys have a grill with wheels, and it's going to go in the parade. There it is. They won, but they won with the best float because they gave out hot dogs. It was genius. Um, yeah, you can even do, you know, TV kind of stuff. You can do a slower story. So it's, and this is like a, a two, two, two and a half minute story. It's a slower reveal. It's more personality driven. I call it an experimental film. Because I'm not a TV guy. I'm a newspaper guy. This is one of those truly magical beaches, an enchanted place surrounded by wildlife that you may not be aware of unless you look a little closer. This is a secluded beach. There's no hotel nearby, there's no resort, there's no spa. But what there is, is beautiful, natural wonders. Now, a lot of people will walk along this beach and they'll walk on that side of the rocks. And that's kind of a mistake. Or they'll walk at the wrong time. And that's also a mistake. So I encourage you to walk on this side of the rocks where the waves are hitting at low tide. And this is what you'll see. Starfish. Isn't that cool? Look at that guy. Now they love these waves. So they spend most of the day out of sight. But if you come here at about 5 o'clock, they catch a few rays of sunshine. And they're not the only types of starfish you'll see here. There's ear urchins and other types of mollusks, a real infinite variety. And uh, well, you've got to walk on the right side of the rocks at the right time of day. All right, so that one kind of mixes a little bit of the personality driven mini documentary kind of science travel um, ridiculous man in hat and sunglasses genre um, but you can see that's what I'm trying to do um, when I'm in my studio in Berlin I'm making tutorials I'm also experimenting um, some things that you might be doing in your newsrooms you know uh, like recipe videos or any kind of mini stage overhead um, assembly shots you know so I, I made this as, an, as a prototype and learned a lot, you know, 
this kind of filmmaking is tedious. I much prefer the adventure travel um, because you really got to anticipate every entrance and exit of every artifact that comes onto the cooking stage. So you have to, it, this actually starts, uh, unlike my other story forms, this actually starts with text. Every other story I've shown you starts with a camera. This kind of story starts with text because it's basically a play. So, like Hollywood movies or screenplays, um, you've got to figure out how characters are going to enter and leave the stage. And that took a lot of work, more than I wanted to. Um, if you're going to be live, welcome to Facebook Live. I've done a lot of these from uh, a lot of places, usually in my office. If you're going to be from the New York Times, buy a damn microphone that has um, a fuzzy thing like this and a dead cat. I can afford it, and I can do you know, windy shots from Panda Azucar in the middle of nowhere, Chile. Um, Nick, you can buy a dead cat. It will help your lives, okay? Sorry for that, but I expect pros, and I think our audience expects when the BBC, AJ Plus, or New York Times does something like that, that they'll equip their reporters with a dead cat and a decent microphone. I expect it, but maybe I'm a media snob. Anyways, um, that was my little push. It's important to invest. Those production values matter. If that's what your brand stands for and that's what my brand stands for, you got to make the investment. Um, this is uh, some examples of the immersive storytelling. I'll just put them up on screen. You can Google it, the BBC Media Action Refugee iPhone. Yeah, um, or phone, rather, not iPhone. Um, the other one is, uh, because we're running short on time, the other one is uh, Trump wins. Uh, this is your phone during a Donald. This was a joke until the election. But this was, uh, this is actually now kind of scary and prescient to look at. So check those out on YouTube, on your phone. Again, that is the user experience. Showing it on screen is also a disaster. The best way to experience a phone sim movie is to watch it on your phone. And you can do that on YouTube, and it'll, it'll show full vertical screen. So that's filmmaking for a vertical viewport, you know, that aspect ratio. So that's not vertical video. That is filmmaking for a vertical screen. It's very different. Two very different things. Um, but you can see through, throughout all of this um, that it is the ability to find and connect shots. That's the challenge as a visual reporter, as a mobile journalist, uh, someone who writes stories with a camera and then writes words to pictures. Um, a couple notes about 360, um, that this also connecting the shots is also important. Um, and also, uh, production values are very important. Has anyone seen this, the 360 uh, uh, surf school? It's five and a half minutes long. It won't kill you to watch it. It's on YouTube. There's a link here. Um, I've got some screen grabs here. This is a great example, not done by journalists, by the way, but done by filmmakers, of what we as journalists should be studying. People who really know this stuff uh, well do some things like this. They use OSG. What are OSG? On-screen graphics. They give directional cues, yeah? So when he says, look, the waves over here and the waves over here are breaking, where we're gonna enter the sea when we go surfing is between those points. What's well, not really clear in the video, but the OSG makes it clear. Also these arrows, when he says, now look at me and see how I dog paddle, guide the viewer to where to look. You notice also now the camera's in a new position. This is now act two. This is a story told in three acts. Where have we ever heard that before? Again, there's nothing new. There's just, you know, there's just new ways to interpret it. It takes place on the beach, it takes place on the s in, at sea, and it takes place on the cliffs over the sea. Those are the three uh, acts, the stages for the acts. So you can see at the sea, there's even two different camera positions. The first was on the board, and the second is handheld as he's surfing. More OSG here to point out as he's talking in his narration. Um, by the way, I did a bad thing, and I cut off this other surfer. So they held it, freeze frame, OSG. Smart. That's storytelling, even though it's 360. The 360 was not the main thing about this why it was a good film. It helped it. It wasn't the thing that really drove it, but it helped it. Um, 
it was a great central character, a very tightly written script, great delivery, great sound, great OSG, and three acts. You can't go wrong with that formula. Um, the other thing where I see a lot of news organizations going wrong is when they go get, get Omni Rig, that $10,000 five or six, you know, GoPro rig, is they'll spend that money because maybe they got a client who wants a 360, and then they'll forget about buying the 360 microphone and multi-track recorder that you need to do VR sound, which is, again, one of the most important things to do. If you're going to do this, do it right. Because as you turn your head, the audience should hear, they're hearing by north side, should hear louder that, uh, that car back there versus the noise over there. Sound mixing is, the most, is, is one of the most important things in that story form. So you need microphones like tetrahedral microphones that record four-track audio, and you need a four at least a four-track audio, maybe one of six or eight tracks, so you can record a couple wireless mics for your talent and your interview subject, depending on what kind of story you're doing. Sound is super important. So I've got um, a lot more tips on 360. I say the best way to get started with 360 is just with still photography. Forget about video at first, unless you got $60,000 to buy a Nokia Ozu. Um, forget about live. You're not going to do it at, at an acceptable quality. But you can do great stuff with still photos, and you can make videos from stills. Um, but so I've got like articles on my site. Uh, one is really popular lately. It's like five tips for filming 360. Uh, this is the number one tip, and this is why. Use a tripod. So when you're out there with a 360 camera um, and you're in front of the Great Pyramid, you can take these shots and make it look like you're the only person there. Right? So use a tripod. That is the number one um, tip for 360 because otherwise you're going to be too close to your face a lot of times. Otherwise, um, the, ho the horizon won't be level. Problems like that. Use a tripod. You can take cool pictures of yourself. If you go to my site and just search 360, you'll see that there's gear recommendations, there's tutorials, there's more stuff as I'm starting to explore 360. Um, but I'm really cautious about 360 video. I think um, one of the coolest things I got last week, I was in Chicago all week last week, was this little extension for my Theta S, which then um, gives me basically these centimeters. So now I can put in an HDMI cable and a power cable. So I could theoretically now plug this into my laptop in my studio at the Smart Film School in Berlin and do 360 video and Facebook will love me and my page will grow. But it'll, it's probably not going to be that great, but Facebook will share it with everyone because that's what they're pushing right now. So you can start doing Facebook Live with something like that. You need this little $12 thing. I got it on Amazon. Um, this one quarter 20 extender and you can start doing lives. So you can see, it, because we have all those hard questions to answer, because these things are popping up so fast, that when I talk with the CEOs and the general managers, whatever your top title is, if, if you're responsible for this stuff, when I talk to you, I say, look, you need to look at this as, as a holistic system. Not everyone needs to be trained to do the stuff I'm showing you. The stuff I'm showing you is VJ stuff, the crisis reporters are the people that get the backpack full of this gear. You parachute them into a crisis situation, you hook them up with a local fixer and a flak jacket, and they just produce. They write with their camera, they interview, they go deep, they go dark, and you just get a stream of still, beautiful rushes that, that is just gold. But you can't expect your whole newsroom to do that because it's, it's James Bond. It's, it's a very special skill set. And but if you have that person with those skills going out and doing the press conferences or doing the little Facebook you know, sports live show from your newsroom, then you're wasting their talent. So you need specialist teams who are doing those kinds of things in your three studios in your newsroom. And everyone in the organization, and I mean everyone, needs to know how to capture, kill, share um, breaking news pictures and have some vid video picture language literacy. Everyone, secretaries, every journalist, everyone in the organization. Then you've got a solid foundation for going to a visual first journalism culture, which is if you're the New York Times, that's what you say you're doing right now. And where they're going, I think a lot of other people will want to go. That's one way to start thinking about how to, how to, how, how to manage to change. Um, yeah, there I was filming that shot of that time lapse, uh, Panda Uzukar. 
but it didn't always do that. In fact, um, it was, you're probably saying, I know that guy, Rob McCormick. Wasn't he like a newspaper designer? Didn't he redesign the San Francisco exam? Didn't he work in Chicago? Wasn't he the page one editor? Yeah, that's the same guy. What, the same guy who also founded Visual Editors, the first social network for visual journalists in 2004. That was me. But at the beginning of that journey, it was me with a Nikon F3 looking for a darkroom. And someone mentioned the newspaper. I was studying organic chemistry. I had no idea what journalism or newspapers or any of that stuff was. But somehow I walked into journalism. And through the process of getting my journalism degree, of course, I switched majors. You know, the journalism degree was pretty demanding. They required you to have three, basically, major studies. I studied sociology, uh, economics, and also graphic design. Got no credit for my journalism degree for studying graphic design. Guess what, though? It unlocked a lot of stuff. Um, but I also had a lot of technology, coding experience. I'd already had 1,000 hours of electronics before I graduated high school, and I knew how to, um, some basics of television production, just from high school. So that's when I went into school, there was a revolution. So students, you're seeing today's revolution, I'm kind of at the edges of it here, but when I was in school, there was something called the desktop publishing revolution, the first digitization of news in newspapers. I, when I graduated, I was the first person in a 500-person newsroom who knew how to design a newspaper page on a computer, on a Mac. It didn't exist. So you have the ability now, I think, if you're getting these skills, to be um, maybe the first person in your organization to be a VJ, a real VJ. And so because I had that, it kind of put me into a lot of innovation projects. So we did, like in the first, first years of my career, I was working on making the next newspaper for the next generation. How many of us did those? I designed Kid News, I designed Excess Magazine, Alternatives, always trying to reach that 18 to 34, you know, young news, future newspaper reader, always trying to grow the future of news. So I did a lot of newspaper redesigns around that. Um, and that always seemed to be part of my journalism career, was product development, yeah? And then it became digital. And then I decided in 2005, as I was the page one editor for, a, you know, working in a Pulitzer Prize winning newsroom in Chicago, for corner office, guitars on the wall, I had it all. I walked away because I looked at two pieces of data. I looked at the average age of a newspaper buyer and the average age of a baby boomer. And the nexus crossed just a few months before. I said, we're not growing any more newspaper readers for the products we're currently making. This company is not making new products that are gonna, and yeah, they're not innovating. So there's only one path forward, and that's contraction. So I left. I left, I got a, and I went into business for myself, doing consulting and training, doing a lot of media development around the world, um, and started to build partnerships, like with schools. Um, and on and on. So the latest stuff has been the Smart Film School, but you can see it all comes back to finding, capturing, killing, sharing stories with a camera. So that I can't change. Um, but I think this is something we can change. That was one of the pictures I think I took last year in Perugia, or maybe the first year here. Uh, what we can change is, is our mindset about um, the fear of the unknown or the fear of the future or the fear of innovation. How many of you have innovation processes in your department, in your newsroom? How are they working out for you? Are you doing it every day? I would say, yeah. If you're gonna do it good, it's like you know, other things, do it every day. Um, and this sucks. I, I mean, not innovation, not what's on there, just that's the wrong way to show you that information. That's probably better. Because I kind of have, I kinda have a, a theory that if you can't visualize something, you probably don't know what the hell you're talking about. If you can't draw me a picture, you probably don't know it well enough. And I think because pictures stay with us, now when we look at the innovation process, we see it much clearer. It's a journey. It's a journey that sometimes has loopbacks to earlier stages we have to iterate. We have goals and we have behaviors that we're doing in each stage. When are we exploring? When are we building? How are we testing? What are we testing? How will we know if we're successful or not? How are we fixing problems or 
creating new opportunities for the people who pay us. So I try to say, look, this stuff looks like kindergarten. If you look at it from afar and you see all this post-it notes and scribbles and post-it boards and blah, blah, and people playing with paints and crayons, you're like, it's a creative process, but let me assure you, it achieves a business result. Um, there you go. This to me was always, I mean, other than working on investigations and winning, you know, big journalism prizes, this stuff, the, 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 the times that I had in my journalism career when I got to work on new products were the most rewarding. The problem with the model from 20 years ago when we were developing products is that if you got, were lucky enough to be recruited for a new team, you know what your reward was for creating the product, a successful product? Well, you got to do that. You got to do the daily edition of that product for the rest of your life. That's the wrong reward for the team that builds it. If you've got a good team of people that build stuff, they build stuff. They don't then go run the stuff they build. That's a different team. Okay, so that's one of the key, the key things that newspapers got wrong, at least in my experience. Um, also, not enough focus on customer. I think we can now see that we've really got to um, provide a lot of value for people to be loyal to us. So, what does it take? And also, a lot of the teams that we put together were just pretty much journalists. So you need cross-functional teams. And we look at what does it really take to develop. Um, we talk, I, you hear a lot of talk from hackathons uh, about these things, not enough about these, because any good product, um, it's kind of like golf. Uh, you're either going to win money or lose money at the end of the golf match by the bet you make on the first tee. You know, how many strokes are you going to give me? How many strokes am I going to give? If you're not a golfer, don't worry. But what I'm saying is that it, it, your success in the other two areas all depend on how well you and your team do the design thinking part. There's a lot of people who teach this idea. They, they call it the human-centered design process. Stanford has the D school method. Maybe you've, you've used that. It's designed for engineers who could care less about people. You know, they care about technology. And so it's good to, to have some of these systems. There's the three gears of business design. I like that one. Um, there's the Google Ventures design sprint, yeah, which is a five-day um, process. <clears throat> okay, that looks cool. Then there's the double diamond design process, and I think this comes from our friends in British Columbia. And I really like this one, because this one's kind of um, very clear um, in terms of strategic and, and execution and how those work. Um, and I've used, I've read those, I've used, I've adopted techniques from those. I've also done this, like you've seen, for my entire career. I also remember something called the maestro planning method. Does anybody remember the maestro planning method from maybe 30 years ago? Hell no. Anyways, it was because I was teaching that to Egyptians in media development, how to, how to use planning, story planning methods to develop visual story packages, that I created this method. And this method lets you do all those things that, that happen in those classical innovation processes in one day, or even on deadline. It's like I said, I'm a newspaper guy, so my focus is the next edition. So I like to break it down into six steps that basically create a push-pull, that basically force a team to rapidly um, brainstorm and then rapidly contract th the best decisions and move forward to the next step. So it is a process that is constantly putting um, ideas under tension. Yeah, There's an expansion phase and there's a reduction phase. Um, and because we are journalistic creatures, it works really well when working with, with journalists um, to use time boxing, to give the teams just one task to focus in a specific time frame, and not to try and solve the whole problem or skip ahead. That's what I have to, to watch out for. Um, and to be successful, you need people with different skills to look at what the problem or opportunity is. I'm gonna try and wrap this up quickly so in case there's questions. Um, Basically, it's going to be consumer focused. There's a problem or there's an opportunity. What do we need to do to meet those needs or solve those pain points? You know, there's uh, the example I could show real quickly is 24 Sata in Zagreb. Um, here they are doing Facebook Lives with Osmos, uh, with reporters in the field. Um, 
They've been exploring video. They've had failures. They tried to do TV in their newsroom five, six years ago. It was a failure. Now they're really successful doing this and developing YouTube stars. So now they're building three new studios. They're redoing their whole place, and they are going to be a hub for the next generation of video producers. They're getting back to their roots with web video. They've abandoned TV. But, of course, they, like everyone else, want to find out how to better serve their loyal audiences. So for their design challenge, um, this was the, the design challenge. This was the challenge, um, how can we better serve or grow our loyal audience? Is it new content? Is it new service? Is it new products, new functions? Um, and so I said, good, that's your challenge. Now, here's what I recommend for your teams. Give me a, a sales expert, a technical expert, a design expert, and an audience expert. Okay? And that's the team. I was expecting them to give me one team. <laughs> they gave me three. Um, actually, they gave me four. I just had pictures of three. And because they said three and then four showed up. And then I said, well, we need two deciders. So in case there's any um, indecision uh, or there's a problem with the team moving forward, we need a, bo a big boss to come in and, and hear a pitch from them and, and say which direction to go in. So we had two deciders. And they started to look at this. They had to look at per uh, personalities of, uh, of their users um, to explore that problem. So they brought in an expert from, from the audience department to, to give them a briefing about their typical user so that they were better informed. And throughout this process, you know, there's the team has to go through those steps. They're led by somebody like me, and there's the decider who's usually the person who hires me um, to, to, to work the process. And it is. It's very analog. It's very much like kindergarten. There I am with my iPad, my time boxer, um, as the teams go through the process of trying to ask the right questions to get to the answers for what they need to build what they need to build. And at the end of the day, what they've got to do is make a perfect pitch, a three-minute pitch to the CEO, right, on one poster board. Let me just kind of skip ahead. So this it starts out really simple, but what you get to is a perfect pitch, where you can stand up proudly behind a, a poster board with three of your colleagues and say, look, here's the challenge in 140 characters or less. Here's what we know about our typical user and here's our solution or our new, brilliant new idea. So in three breaths, you can make a pitch. Sorry. That's the goal. Uh, I'll just skip through. This is like one of the right steps. Um, I also, like if groups are um, struggling with something, like coming up with ideas or st struggling to get things going, I'll bring out some, some tools to help them look at problems or find answers in different ways. One of those is called the Idea Generator. It's a really good one. You can Google that. Um, it's a really good tool to use if you're looking for um, new approaches to old problems. So, they had to come up with a user customer profile and a solution. And, you know, we had four teams. And at the end of the day, the boss, there's the boss, got three minute pitches from each of them. And two of those ideas moved forward immediately to the board. Within one week, they were refined. Those, those, those teams were tasked to make a better quality presentation to refine some of the feedback and, and make a pitch to the board so they could get green lighted. So it is a way, it does have a real business result, and it is a way to speed up um, the development phase, even if you already have a young staff, even if you already have a staff that is used to doing things visually and video. Um, it's just a great exercise, um, and like I said, I can be, it should be pretty much a daily exercise in every newsroom, because there's always new problems and opportunities for us. So that's me, I'm Rob. Um, if you have any questions, we have time. We got got a few minutes. Yeah. I forgot to drink water, so excuse me. Any any questions? Okay, go ahead. Oh. Hi, Rob. Melissa Pesic, Media Diversity Institute, London. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, 
there are obviously different definitions of immersive journalism. And at this festival, there are several sessions where the term is mentioned. What is your definition uh, of immersive journalism? I think uh, that the challenge, and I've, I've said this for a long time, um, can I put my audience where I'm at? And, and that's my mindset. If I'm standing in front of a geyser in, in Chile, what does it take for me to put you there in a way that's interesting, you know, either entertains you or informs you or maybe does both, um, makes you think about it, yeah? Or matters. I think to me it's, it's, it's only that. How do you interpret that can, it has many different interpretations, but yeah, that's my interpretation. Any other questions? Are you guys awake? Did, we, did I put everyone to sleep by turning on? Maybe we should turn the lights back up. What do you think? It happens. It's the movie theater effect. Oh yeah, if you want more, if you want to do this, I've got, um, I've got tutorials online. I do um, bulk discounts, education discounts, and people like this take advantage of it. So uh, if there's no more questions, or if you want to talk outside, I've got my toys. I'll have my toys also at 6 a.m. tomorrow. If you did not sign up for the Sunrise Film Walk, now you kind of know what we're doing. Maybe right? you can tell us what we are doing tomorrow. You're coming. I applied for it. Well, so. okay, so if, at 6 o'clock we're going to meet in the lobby, and I'm going to give you like a crash course in shot making, and then I'm going to give you a challenge to go out and find an original story, make the shots, and then we're... In an hour, you'll come back, and we'll have a cappuccino at the, and we will look at shots, and we'll talk about edits and ways you can edit it. And then hopefully you'll share it and use the hashtag, and everyone here will say, "Oh, that was such a good idea to have a film walk and have the opportunity to find, capture, kill a story before everyone else even woke up." Okay, thanks, guys. referencing Darjeeling Limited for those of you who've ever seen a Wes Anderson movie. Not bad. Not bad for this little bot right within there and I could, I could overwrite it, give it just the journalistic and just the filmmaking touches I needed and I instantly I could put that on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, wherever it needed to go. Or to my mom, usually write to my mom's the first social media, you know. So this is revolutionary stuff, and that's why I really am addressing this talk to the students because they are the torchbearers. The people who will help us in the new era to find new land. I love that quote. This is from a journalism school in Paris where I teach. It's the new school of journalism. And they take uh, design thinking also as a required skill. So innovation methods combined with mojo. That's the intersection we're exploring today as well. Does anybody know what they are great? But you're not my target audience. You still might get something out of it. Um, but seriously, I was looking at alternate transport. Um, it was al almost going to be that serious um, because we were grounded and we were told by Air Berlin, no flights to Rome until Saturday, which, you know, ain't going to work. I um, wanted to start off with something real quick that I just discovered in my in iPhone, and it's probably just the latest update, and I just hadn't gotten around to it. But did you know you can cut pretty good quality social videos right within the Photos app. I didn't know that either. But all of a sudden, because I had just spent 30 days living in a dusty 4x4 in the Atacama Desert in Chile f making films, I I'd go into my Photos app all the time, and it would start, and it somehow it was like 
what's this memories thing? Yeah, I was like, it's bogus. You know, I looked at it once or twice. I'm like, that's not how I would edit it. Anyways, it's kind of cute. Maybe people, consumers will like that. What I find out is I dig into it yesterday, and I just, these are brand new slides. No one's seen them. You're the first. Um, is that it's actually a bot that's basically using some metadata from the pictures, like maybe location, time of day, um, faces. And it's trying to, it's trying to cut, a, cut a reel, yeah, from shots in your gallery. And that's cool and enough. You can, um, it does it really quickly, and, um, but you can give it a little help and get a lot better results. It's true cool, and it's filmmaking, and that's where we're going to start. My name's Rob. Uh, I'm a journalism professor. I live in Berlin. I obviously do not have a German accent. I'm American, um, but I've worked abroad for the last 10 years um, doing this kind of stuff and teaching journalists worldwide how to do this. I teach at two journalism schools, one in Paris, one in Austria. The only two journalism sc schools that I know of right now that require every journalism student to be a mojo. The same way when I went to journalism school, every journalism student had to study comm law, ethics, news writing, and editing. Well, guess what? Mojo is now a required skill at that level, at those schools, and probably more before we're done. Um, so just a quick question. Anybody have any trouble getting here? I did. There was a strike. My flight was canceled. It took about half the day yesterday to figure out another way to get to Rome. It felt like this. It wasn't this flight. But it might as well have been. Because we were flying by the seat of our pants to get here. And we're so glad we got here to do a sunrise film walk at 6 this morning and to share with you um, this lecture, which is really designed for those journalism students, for, the, for you. That's who this talk is for. That's the audience I have in mind. If you're a publisher, great. If you're a mid-career uh, journalist, great. If you're a journalism educator, this is. How, how would you describe a shot like this? Well, it's, it's the Alps. It's, it's daytime. There's a woman. Um, but it's actually, you know, it's um, anamorphic. It's shot with an anamorphic lens at an aspect ratio of 2.39 to 1. You know, just like Star Wars, Blade Runner, all your favorite movies. But it was shot on my iPhone. That's the difference. Shot at 24 frames per second. Yep. On this little tripod with that iPhone with an anamorphic lens. We now can do things that were way beyond reach, only available to elite Hollywood people or people with expensive rental budgets with our phones. And that is damn exciting because that technology means we can go to the top of the mountain and make a film and it only takes up that much space in the backpack that we're living out of for seven days as we make a hut to hut tour around Lesch, Austria. That's the anamorphic lens. That's not cropped to that shape. It's a distortion lens that squeezes optically more information from the sides. And the app you use, Filmic Pro, which is a pro video app, it digitally de-squeezes it. There's the same rig, uh, different mountains. This is the Rocky Mountains. So again, that's got, again, some consumer controls. You know, do you want gentle, chill? Do you want it short, medium, long? And it'll kind of algorithmically optimize a suggested reel based on that album that it's detected yeah, from the metadata. But if the real power for editors, and, and we're journalists, so that's where we want to go. We want to go to the advanced level. We want to go to that little slider down there and start to get access to the edit, to the shots, the shots that answer story questions. Who, what, when, why, where, how, what happens next? How do we go from here to here? Um, and other things like that, and maybe the length. So, so I'm not in an advanced editing. I'm not in iMovie. I'm not in Luma Fusion. I'm not in anything but my gallery editing, and it's just a delight to use. You can't do everything. You can't do multi-track editing. You can't rearrange clips. But what you can do can be quite powerful and quick because I'm all about going to the edge of the frontier, producing original stories at the highest possible production values in near real time and never ever coming back to a newsroom to file, edit, or share. That's where I live 24 7. 
So this kind of tool is really great when you're on the fly. If you want to get a quick assemb first assembly of a scene you just shot, why not just start in a really lightweight app like the Photos app and see what you can make. 